Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Cryptic Conversations. I'm your host, Tunes from the Crypt, and we have another very special episode in store today. Today's guest, you know, it's, it's with great honor and a pleasure to host him. Today's guest is a man named Parker, previously known as Duscope, but is now making music under the operator P alias. He is the owner of the 95 Dance record label and is a UKG head from Toronto, Canada. His production, selection, and love for the scene has earned him love and support from artists Artists such as Lo Steppa, DJ EZ, Roger Sanchez, and many more. Once described as someone with ears beyond his, their ears, he has landed industry top labels such as Shall Not Fade, Sima Black, Nuvolve, and Space Disco, just to name a few. His early efforts in 2020 have landed him global support and allowed him to gain the badge of being one of Track Source's top 100 artists. He's played some of the most reputable venues in his region, such as Department of Civilian Dance, Coda, Wiggle Room, and more. He has supported and played alongside big name artists such as Conducta, Mall Grab, Derek Carter, Joris Ward, and more. And I'm extremely excited to have him share his story with us today. Welcome. Thank you, man. What an introduction. Yeah, well deserved. So, so yeah, to kind of kick things off, I wanted to tell the, the listeners, tell the audience about how we met. Um, you know, it was kind of interesting, you know, when I first started my DJ career, um, I'm not even sure how we connected, to be honest. I think it was from that one Facebook group, uh, Wavepoint, the Wavepoint music, uh, Facebook group. Yeah, yeah, I think that adds up, man. Yeah, I think that's how we connected. And then I started seeing this guy's music and I was like, dude, who is this guy? I was like, dude, this music is amazing. <laughs> like, I was like, and I, I was just, I just started engaging with all of your music and all of your content. I was like, man, like, this guy needs to be bigger. You know, I was like, this guy's music is amazing. You know what I mean? And then sure enough, he started, he started to grow, he started growing, started getting a lot bigger. And, you know, like I said, I started my DJ career and it's funny, man. I think it's funny how strangers, man, like that you're in a completely different country. I'm over here in LA and this guy helped me out, man. And my own quote unquote friends, where are they at, man? So it's funny how sometimes strangers help you out more than your own, your own, your own friends. Yeah, man, it's uh, it's crazy that this uh, like the music, this music industry, like allows you to meet so many different people from so many different places, man. Like, I feel like I have some better relationships with people in other countries than I yeah. do with people I grew up with my whole life. Like, that's just the facts. Yeah, sometimes that's how it goes, you know. Okay, so yeah, man. So to kick things off, man. So so tell me why the the decision for the name change? Why why did you change from Duscope to Operator P? Um, I think I've really been like contemplating the name change for like a really long time. And, uh, you know, I'd always discuss it with, you know, some of my close industry people. And, you know, I got a lot of mixed reviews on the idea, like, you know, Parker, like, you should just keep the name, like, keep the name, like, it's gonna grow, it's gonna grow this and that. And then like, in the back of my head, I was always like, but do I want like, do I want to grow with that name? Like, I feel like if I make this change earlier, like, it's gonna be a little bit better for me. Like, I don't want to be like, you know, let's just say I end up like blowing up for whatever reason, you know what I mean? And then like, I want to change the name. Like, it's going to be a lot harder to, you know, come back to where I am at that stage than it would be early on. You know what I mean? Like, I don't feel like I've made it by any means or I'm like, you know, that massive of an artist or anything like that. You know what I mean? So I figured time was right. Like I was already kind of transitioning my sound and I thought that, you know, Let's just go with another name, new sound, keep things more fresh. And uh, I'll just take it from there and, you know, we won't look back. So that's kind of been the mindset with it, really. Nice. I love it. Yeah. So you're definitely transitioning into the real UKG. Um, so I'd like to ask yeah, you, <laughs> I'd like to, I'd like to ask you, you know, like, uh, so how did you come up with the name Duscope? You know, what inspired that name? And then how did you come up with this name? What inspired this name? Um so duscope was um it's funny how that got inspired to be honest sometimes i don't even like telling the story because it's so <laughs> fucking hilarious um but like i was between jobs and like i was just trying out this was like many years ago too i was like maybe like 20 and uh, I'm, I'm 28 now just for reference so i was uh between jobs trying different things out and uh, i went into a sales role to sell some fucking vacuum cleaners <laughs> and uh there was like this little piece that went on the vacuum called the the dust scope 
<laughs> it was like basically like the prime like demo product like we're gonna show the people that you know your vacuum is absolute garbage and <laughs> you know ours is great we're gonna use this little tool right here and i just i don't know like it just i was like playing it back in my head i'm like dustscope like that sounds like i don't know it could be kind of cool i'm like all right <laughs> fuck it i'll just like rearrange it because like it didn't flow off the tongue nicely like dust scope like that just there's so much tension like in between the words so i just ha- kind of had to like smooth it up a little bit and then at the same time i was also like contemplating like seo purposes like google and stuff like like if you google dust scope like i'm the first thing to pop up for like a few yeah. pages you know what i mean um so that was like a huge part of it too i really didn't want it to you know sound like anything else or like be like my name like i got a buddy and like he uses his name and for like the longest time if you googled you know his alias like you just got like basketball players and you know everything else under the sun oh, yeah before you know he was able to claim his his google his google page um but as far as operator p um i can't say there was like a crazy amount of influence behind it but yeah, I kind of just like the way it sounded, to be honest. Like, I always did want to play more into my name a little bit. Like, you know, I didn't make a new alias. I call myself Parker, Parker Nugent, Parker Nuge or whatever. But I still wanted to have that P in it. Like, you know, I still wanted to pay some respects to, you know, my birth name. Um, operator, I feel like is what I'm always doing at the end of the day. Like, whether I'm operating the DAW or operating the DEX, like, that's kind of that's kind of what this is, right? Like, we're always, you know, operating. So <laughs> I kind of thought that worked out and uh operator p my man so that's how that's how that went down that's dope man love to hear the story yeah so i i definitely think you're you're heading in the right direction so so with 95 dance uh so i saw on your facebook you know it's about to see its first play on bbc radio one did that happen already or when is it going to happen uh i believe that's supposed to happen this weekend this week on annie nightingale's show i may have butched that um but i'm pretty sure that's the name and um yeah that's uh, a track called diddy bahu off the diddy bahu ep from one tk he's uh the other part of the label helps me out with uh lots of things it's pretty much me and him running it nice. so uh really happy to see that i'm happy that you know artists can give me their music and trust that i'm gonna do my best to get it out there so you know that was a that was a huge bonus to get that email we were really excited about it Nice, bro. Congrats. Um, so, yeah, yeah, so, so before we get to know Operator P, you know, I want to know more about Parker. You know, tell me about your early life. Where did you grow up? You know, what was your what was your family life like, your early life like? So I live just outside of Toronto in the GTA uh, on the east side. I live in Whitby, Ontario. Um, in like the early, early days, I actually grew up in Pickering, which is a little bit closer to Toronto. But you know, it's all it's all like relatively the same area, like to be honest. Um yeah, so pretty much grew up in Whitby. Like when I started making music, I lived in in Whitby. Um, but you know, early days for me, I was really into skateboarding. Like that that's what I did. Um, like same kind of energy, like same mindset. Like, you know, I wanted to take that to like the next level. You know, I spend like eight hours a day skateboarding all the time. Oh wow. Yeah, like, honestly, man, like, I think for, like, my whole high school, I lived off McDoubles, like, <laughs> like, just skateboarding and then going to McDonald's for, like, 20 minutes to get, like, a McDouble back when they were, like, a $1.50 yeah. and uh, then going back to the skate park, skating home. And, like, I was skinny as fuck, too, man. Like, I didn't eat, dude. I didn't eat anything. I just skateboarded. And, uh, you know, like, I-, I feel like I did all right with that. Like, I won, like, a couple contests and stuff. And, you know, we used to film and stuff go like downtown with the homies and stuff and like that really covers like a large part of my life like i feel like i like to hyper focus on like certain aspects and then just like just like really push like all my energy into that area so you know at first it was skateboarding then it became music um so essentially how i got into music was that uh i just got tired of hurting myself man like i was i was saving up some money to go on a skateboarding trip actually and then like i collapsed the arch in my foot oh wow and like it was terrible so i just had all this money sitting there and like i you know i was talking to my friends it seemed like i was like the only one who like really saved up the money to go on the trip anyway so i was like you know what like fuck it man like i need a new hobby so i bought like a pair of decks and you know started djing 
that was uh that was kind of like the introduction to it anyway nice so what kind of injuries did you uh get <laughs> well um a lot of ankle problems Ooh, like yeah. just just sprains really like i never really broke okay. anything skateboarding uh. like yeah, like the foot like the the arch of my foot like that that really sucked um i did break my front teeth uh that sucked a lot too oh wow that's, that's probably the worst because like i'm still kind of paying for that today you know what i mean like i have uh. like teeth issues because of that um so that how did, was probably, how like, did the that worst happen scenario. how did that happen um i was at the skate park and we were all skating an obstacle uh my one buddy landed his trick my next buddy went down to back him up, landed his Ooh. tricks. I was feeling like super confident. I'm like, all right, right here. Like, we're going to bang this out. Went to go on the ledge, uh, slipped out. Like, to give you context, like, like my feet were like behind my head. Like, I was heading oh, towards wow. the ground. And uh, like, I basically just like bit the ground like an apple. Ooh. And uh, like, I looked up, I <laughs> felt some, like some grittiness in my mouth, mm -hmm. spat out some teeth. And like, man, I go into shock. Like I went to the bathroom. I was like crying. I'm like, I'm never ever going to get laid. Like this is <laughs> terrible. <laughs> yeah, man. Like that, like that's actually facts though, man. Like I was so traumatized by that. Luckily I was still on my mom's benefits at the time. So she hooked me up, went and got a, a partial and, uh, you know, some fillings. <laughs> damn. Here we are today, you know? Yeah. Damn. I remember as a kid as a kid too me and my me and my nephews we were like playing tag or hide and seek or something and and he ran into a pole and yeah he broke his teeth into a on the pole it's tough um so <laughs> I feel like most of the time you hit up from like hockey players and stuff like they get the puck in the face yeah so what about you know real quick last question about skateboarding uh so what what was your like do you have a a, mem a memory or a moment like your favorite like trick trick that you landed or like a, a your favorite memory or moment yeah uh yeah. there's a few 100 percent, man uh but i'll give you two um so closer to the end of my skateboarding i was filming uh we used to call it like full-length video so like we all go out and like film tricks for like a year or two and you know try to create like a you know like a three four minute part and um i managed to do this backside big spin down the the eight stair in oshawa oh wow at the bell center i was really excited i'll, I'll send you the video if you want maybe you can like put it in there or something oh yeah, if yeah not, for sure. no, no worries man but oh, i'll yeah. send it to you um there's a cool story behind that too because uh like my buddy really had to leave like i basically made him miss the last bus because like i told him i was gonna <laughs> land the trick and like you have like a bit of a journey home and i was like come on man like just stick around and he did and like thankfully like i rolled away it was really cool Nice. Um, and there's one other moment. Uh, I got first place in this best trick contest at this uh, indoor skate park called 416. And uh, I did a few cool, cool tricks that day. Uh, I basically just skated the handrail the whole time. I did no slide, big spin, uh, back feeble, uh, board slide. Um, but basically, like, yeah, I ended up rolling away from all of those. And uh, I got one a skateboard and I don't know, I think like pair of wheels maybe or something like that i can't remember man but you know i was very happy it was like probably the biggest rail i ever did some of those tricks down so nice i was pretty dude. hyped on it nice yeah send yeah, that video man. send that video and i'll add it <laughs> yeah, yeah. i will hell yeah i definitely yeah. will man i'm not sure if you're familiar with nigel houston you, you know nigel houston oh, yeah 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 of he's course, always he's always out here at the la raves you always see him around he's, he's always i think he's starting to dj too now um so <laughs> yeah so uh I think as ravers that we always enjoy hearing about the rave journey of others. So obviously, so you started with skateboarding, then you got into DJing. So tell me about your first yeah. rave, your first rave events. Like how did you get into house music or the rave scene, the electronic music scene? Yeah, man. So I guess like I, I started to touch on it a little bit, but I, I thought you might ask me this. So I, I didn't want to go too far into details. Um, so yeah, like I, basically hurt myself um all around the same time like i uh i met a dude who lived on my street one day i was like walking by or i think i was skateboarding actually and he was sitting in the bus stop blasting some beats and um i kind of heard of house music before like my sister was really into it when i was young so i guess maybe that's like my earliest uh, introduction okay. to it was like her playing a little bit but you know i never like asked too much about it or you know really knew anything but i knew what it was called and uh, I walked by and I was like, so what's that? It's like some dope ass house music. And he's like, looked at me and like, was like, yep, 
that's exactly what that is. And I like, you know, talked to him for like a little bit. Turns out he knew my sister, funny enough. And um, yeah, he said I could come by his place. Said he had some DJ decks. I could give him a try. I said, sure. So, you know, a couple of weeks later, I went to his place. And uh, this is all around the time I hurt myself, right? And uh, basically, because I met him, I decided I was going to buy some DJ decks. I actually looked at him. I said, yeah, like, I'm going to get a pair of these. Like, like when usually when I start something, like, I want to do it, you know? And like, basically what I was saying to you earlier. And that's exactly what I did. I went and bought myself some decks. And uh, he was nice enough. He had a massive music library. So he gave me a big, uh, a big library, basically from, like, letter A to, like, letter K in artist. You know what I mean? Because I couldn't even take it all on my on my drive. And I learned with that music. Um, essentially, pretty much right after that or around that time, I got this is like I was like 19. So just old enough to drink here in Canada. And I was invited to a club called the government, which was a super club, basically a multi venue club two main rooms and like a bunch of these little side rooms and crevices and every now and then or once a month or maybe twice a month i'm really not sure they had something called all access nights and at the time there was a little bit of a party crew out in my ends in whitby and oshawa and what they used to do is take a party bus down for these all access nights so this was like really cool and like a really honestly like dope moment where everything kind of came together because at these all access nights, all these rooms had different sounds in them. So, you know, I walk into the main room and it was like, you know, like 2014, like, you know, Zez dead or yeah. like Tiesto kind of sounds, you know? Yeah. And then you wiggle your way through the fucking club. And next thing you know, I'm in this room called the acid lounge and it's like oh, it's yeah. deep and it's dirty. You know what I mean? Like yeah. maybe like for reference, more like night bassy kind of sounds like oh, early okay. early night bass like yeah. introduction to some wants and stuff and yeah. you know some other rooms it was more like deep housey like you know like old low steppa kind of vibes yeah you know so like there was a lot to a lot to take in on those nights and i didn't really know what any of these genres were called or anything you know but i knew that i really liked what i was hearing and like i was super super into going back you know and that's pretty much like that was like my introduction for sure. Like I met a lot of people through the party bus and stuff. Like we hung out, we used to go do the afters at their house and we all bring our DJ decks and we mix, you know, and drink and, you know, other festivities and <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Um. But yeah, man, like that was pretty much it for me. I knew I was hooked right after I went to that one spot. It doesn't exist nice. anymore. RIP the government. Oh, but yeah. Uh, yeah, man. Nice. So it sounds like you started DJing, then you went to that club. So yeah, for me, it was the opposite. It was like, dude, I was a raver forever until I finally, you know, stopped getting distracted by partying. And I finally locked myself <laughs> yeah. in the room and, and learned how to how to DJ. Um, so what about before skateboarding? Did you did you have like a a musical era in you know, in your early years? Did you were you a musician or? I tried to pick up a bass guitar when I was like really young. My sister was really into singing, actually. She mm -hmm. used to, I know in the States you have American Idol. Yeah. Like back in the day. So in Canada, we had Canadian Idol. My uh -huh. sister was like really into singing and uh, like she was on that show. Oh, nice. You know, she made it past like the, like the judges and stuff. And, you know, she was, she, she made it pretty far. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? So like really the music part of my family was definitely focused on her uh -huh. uh, for like the first like long time, you know what I mean? And then. You know, she got out of that. She had like kids and stuff and, you know, moved on to other things. And then I guess it just became like my time to give it a go. Yeah. But no, I wouldn't say there was much like really. I just looked at a skateboard video one time and I was like, yup, that's me right there. Like, I need to do that. And like, that's like I hyper fixated on that, man. Yeah, like, yeah. I just came home like like eight hours a day, man. Skated, got home, watched skate videos for the last four, went to bed, dreamed about skateboarding. Nice. Like, that's it. Yeah, man. So after you went, what did you say the name of that club was? The government, right? The government, yeah. yeah. So, so after you went there, did, like, did you start going to festivals? And like, what what were some of those early artists that influenced your your uh, musical journey? Man, like it's it's so broad, like you know, like well, I mean, for artists it is because, like I said, like I didn't know what anything was. Like I I really had to dig around and find it. Oh and yeah, me too. Obviously, I was getting influenced from the people I was around, like. 
I went through a I went through a moment where I was really into that like Melbourne bounce sound, like Timmy Trumpet and shit. Like I thought that yeah. was cool as fuck for a little <laughs> bit. Or like uh what's what's that one track like Mammoth or oh yeah um <laughs> Like those, like those early ones, right? Yeah. Or like dubs, like those guys are actually from Toronto, so like oh, a lot yeah. of people were like hyping them up, right? Yeah, um, yeah. But I, I say like, like that library that my buddy gave me. Like once I started to get familiar, like there was a name in that library that stuck out to me a lot. It was Low Steppa, and uh, I used nice. to like, yeah, I just they super jam those records like so real or like the panel, uh, like some of those records I was really into, and you know even even today I think. Like that guy has a huge influence on me, like especially the early sound, because it just had all the flavors of all the things that I still like today. You know, it was kind of like borrowed from so many different places and then kind of put in this one genre around like 124 BPM. And, you know, I thought that was the shit. Um, but I did go to some festivals. I know you asked me about festivals. Uh, the first festival I ever went to was called Bestival. And they brought that to Toronto, but it's actually a UK festival. And I guess they were looking to expand and we had an island. It kind of, it kind of mimicked the same, uh, the same sort of vibes over in the UK. Like, I think there you get on a ferry, you travel to an island and then like you're there for the festival and they're able to mimic that in Toronto. Yeah. So, yeah. So we took a ferry there on the island and that was like the best time of my life man i've seen so many cool artists there i've seen scream there seeing nice. florence and the machine and oh yeah you know i can't even remember it all like to be honest like i remember scream he was like a stick out artist for me going there oh yeah um there's some really cool stages and you know the, the bummer part of it was the following year they didn't put it on the island again i think that was kind of the beginning of the end for the festival it it built up a lot of a, a lot of hype and you know a lot of people who weren't really like true ravers i guess you could say like went to the festival and they they just bitched about the ferry ride because <laughs> you know it's a bit it's a it's a bit slow like at the end of the night trying to get off the island so yeah it didn't last too long uh, i went to electric island a lot i go there actually every year at least once or twice that's kind of been like the spot i i go to nice yeah. nice yeah yeah for me what my journey like i started in 2008 i was like a 15 16 year old kid going to these warehouse raves these underground warehouse raves in la in like the the ghetto part of la like compton you know going to these sketchy warehouse raves and it was uh first i started with drum and bass you know i, I was really in love with drum and bass like uh I'm not, uh i really liked rusco caspa uh, oh yeah 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 uh, uh net sky i was into all that and then and then after that, I got into like dubstep, like the old school dubstep, like the, the UKF channel, you know, I was into that, you know, Zed's dead and all that. Oh, man. And then uh, and You're then bringing I went up uh, memories. Yeah, bro. And then uh, I went through a phase like you, too. I remember in like 2012, 2013, like that main stage house music. And I really mm. like I. I went through that phase, but I realized like, man, this is not my thing, you know, and then after that, I, fa- yeah. I started I started to find <laughs> after that, I started to find a uh, disclosure and disclosure realized like, dude, yeah, this is my shit, bro. Like Deep House. Um, who else? Um, Carl Cox, you know, right. Yeah. You know, low step, all them. And so ever since then, you know, I, I knew that, you know, I was a house head for sure. Um, you know what, man? Like, I feel like you're kind of like telling like my story at the same time, like it, like on the spot, like it's hard for me to remember like every little thing, but dude, you're absolutely right. I actually had that moment in high school with my buddy, like the whole Rusco, Caspa, like the dubstep oh, yeah. part. Like that actually is like a prerequisite to yeah. me DJing and stuff as well. And, and disclosure, like I actually forgot all about that, but you're you're bang on UKF, yup, all that, man. Yeah, for bro. sure. Memories, man. All right, so yeah, uh, so you've received recognition from both local and international artists. How did these connections come about and what did they mean for your career? Uh, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> well, we'll start with the with the locals. Um, yeah, there's definitely some some cool names locally who have done lots of great things and continue to do great things. Uh, you know, some names to mention or uh, Hatiris or Flipside. Like those are those are two guys who took an interest in me pretty early on and like i'll always always cherish that um i mean george atiras he runs a label called space disco yeah um you know i just i sent some music over there 
actually, I sent some music to Phoenix Music and I met Andy Reid. He's another guy who does some really great things around here. And uh, I went to one of his parties. It was a, a joint party, Space Disco Phoenix. And when I was there, Andy started playing my record that I sent him. And, you know, he looked over at George and was like, you know, that's Parker's record. And he was like, damn, like that, that that's pretty dope. That's pretty good. And then we, oh, you know, yeah. we chatted a little bit after and he said, you uh, know, which, send over uh, some music. Which record was that? This was on Phoenix Black called Every Day. Nice. On Phoenix Black. It's yeah. like a like a really punchy drum, like cool bass line. Oh, yeah. I don't know, man. We need a different we need a different video for all the records, man. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, that that was that record, and then I ended up sending him over a record with me and my boy Brock called um, what was that record called? Damn, I'm brain farting right now. It's uh first record on Space Disco, though. You know what, man? I'll uh I'll tell you after because I can't yeah, remember right yeah. the second. Yeah. No worries. And uh, we can put it on there. But, um, you know, that was like the start of that relationship. You know, after that, I played a few space disco parties as well. So, you know, you ask how that did for my career. Um, you know, we played some parties with them. I've, you know, been over to his place and, you know, we've like showed each other music and, you know, ask questions, help each other out and stuff. And, you know, share on social media and like help the help the reach. You know what I mean? Just becomes like uh like a team effort at the end of the day you know what i mean and it, you know it really helps when it's local yeah um i feel like i kind of neglected the local part for a long time really just so focused on being somewhere else you know i kind of neglected what yeah. i had here yeah um which we'll touch on that a little bit later um because that does come full circle um internationally i can't say that a lot of the records that you know in the early days like i did sign the sima black and that helped me it didn't really help me score any gigs or anything like that like i, I feel like that sound maybe wasn't so relevant here in toronto um but people did know the name so i definitely got some street credit for it and i remember when the record dropped i did get a lot of facebook likes and instagram followers for the record so that did help me on social media growth it did nice man yeah i remember uh i think you you sent me that that track uh closer to the truth before you uh put it out i remember you, you were like hey bro check this one out and i i love that track bro i, I was playing that oh, one yeah. in, in my sets for a while um so yeah Good, so man. so uh landing on labels like you mentioned you know shall not fade and sima black you know it's impressive uh can you share your experiences and challenges in the music production and release process, if there's any? Oh yeah. Um, music production challenges are <laughs> like every other time you go in there, you know? And like, I, I feel like I cut, like I know how to produce music. So like, for me, it's not like I go in and like, I'm trying to create like a certain, certain sound or anything like that. I don't have any issues with that. Like I can always get it on paper. Uh, for me, it's definitely just being like creative and like actually coming up with the concept and yeah. most of the time i go sit down i'm never like you know today i'm gonna make a track that sounds like you know whatever it is in my head like it's never ever like that yeah like i just come in i sit down and you know i'm just vibing or i'm not and sometimes like if you come into the session like multiple times or you know like a few days or it could be like a couple of weeks and like you're not vibing it like you get really down on yourself and you start thinking like like, why the fuck do I do this shit? You know what I mean? It just doesn't make me happy. And then, yeah. you know, you sit down that one time and, you know, everything comes together like yeah. butter on toast. Yeah. And you're like, holy shit, like, I love this stuff. Like, I need to do this all all day. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, <laughs> But, like, yeah, I just, like, procrastinate a lot, man. Like, to be fair. Like, I'll, I'll get, like, a good idea going. I'll get burnt out on it in, like, a few hours. And I, maybe it's just, like, ear fatigue or something. Like, I heard it, like, a thousand times, like, trying to make a solid eight-bar loop idea. And then I just procrastinate or like collaborations. Like I tend to procrastinate a lot too. I I don't really like working with stems that much. Um, it's just, it's a visual thing for me too. Cause I have to go in and like chop it all out. Like it's hard for me to like, you know, take like a kick drum out. Like it's, it's not, it's really laziness. Like I just gotta like chop it out and that's annoying. Um, as far as, uh, you know, releasing yeah. complications, uh, really just getting your music heard is, is probably like the hardest part, like to be fair. Um, so I did release on, on shall not fade 
earlier this year and it actually took me like a whole year to craft the tracks that I sent to them. Like I basically went in hibernation. I knew I wanted, like, that was the goal. Like I wanted that record label. I wanted my name on shall not fade time is now. And, um, I sent them one record like a year before, and I don't even know if they listened to it, but you know, I felt like I, you know, did myself short. Like they never signed singles. Like I don't know why I sent a single, but I oh, fucking wow. did. You know what I mean? Like it's always like EPs because they put on the vinyl. Uh, so I like went into hibernation, made like four records. Well, I made three records, and then I sent one off for a remix, and I ended up getting Groovy D to remix it, and he's put on the label a few times. So nice. I thought at the very least, if I got someone on the label to remix it, they would at least open my email. If I put it, you know, in the subject line, like <laughs> I'm, I'm a fan of creating your own luck, man. Like, that's, oh, yeah. like that sounds kind of like, I don't know. Like, it doesn't really make sense. Like it's luck. Like how do you create luck? But yeah. you know, you, you fucking can, <laughs> you know what I'm <laughs> saying, bro. And uh, like, that's, that's kind of how I go about this whole, this whole industry, man. Um, You know, to be fair, but um, yeah, man. So they, they took it right away. Like I got a, an email back two days later, not even. They're like, yeah, like we love to sign this. So I was like, fucking yes, man. Like all that hard nice. work paid off. Like I put no music out that year at all. I just sat down and you know, it was tough too because I was making records that like a different sound I've ever made. Like I had like a breaks track and a jungle yeah. track and nice. like, a more fast paced like garage record. And you know, before that, it was all like really houseier stuff. So yeah. that was like a big accomplishment for me in multiple different areas. Nice. Yeah, I remember. Uh, you know what. When I first started, you know, producing music and I had questions for you, uh, you were always so open and willing to help me. So thanks again. I appreciate you. I remember. What did you tell me? You were like, yeah, bro. Like I asked you about uh, releasing on record labels and you're like, yeah, bro. Honestly, they're like they're like getting pokey badges. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what, man? Like I, I said that with purpose because like maybe if I maybe if I lived over in like the UK where the sound that I am dabbling in is a lot more hot, then maybe I could get a little bit more out of it. Like I'd be more accessible, right? Like if a promoter is like, you know, looking for like a new artist, someone new that's kind of popping up. And let's say I got that shall not fade release. And, you know, I was, you know, like a 50 pound train away. Like, you know, maybe I could benefit from that a little bit more, but oh, yeah. when, when you're across the world and you're sending tracks to, labels that are you know thousand pound plane flight away and like you know you're only sitting with like a thousand followers on instagram and you know like you're not you know you're not that booming you know like what really is there to benefit other than you know getting that pokey badge like you get some street credit <laughs> for that which like you, like like you can you can use that right like yeah you can like you get you get to leverage that it goes right on the resume, man. It's like, yeah. oh, I worked at McDonald's for 10 years. You know what I mean? Or, you know, <laughs> whoever you're applying to sees that. They're like, all right, all right. You know, so <laughs> it, it is what it is, man. Yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. So so you're known for your contributions to Track Source's Top 100. Could you tell us about the significance of this achievement and how it has impacted your career? Um, So that whole year, really did a lot for me in general that was right at the start of the pandemic and i think that's kind of like where like duscope found duscope sound i had a lot of time to sit behind the computer like we were in lockdown here in canada like for a long time um and we were getting paid for it too you know at least but you know i had some money and <laughs> a lot of a lot of spare time to make music me and my buddy Brock basically were just cracking down in the studio the whole time. And uh, our goal was just like, all right, we want to get on that label. We want to get on this label. Like we want like basically just make the the most of the time we had off. And, you know, that that's what we did. So I think he had something like 40 records come out that year. These are all singles, by the way. Uh, so like 40 singles. I had like 28 singles, maybe 20, maybe a little less, something of that. And, um, you know, every time we put out a record, we have more and more people seeing our name and 
you know, we got more followers or like more, more fans and, you know, people just interacting with us in general, like just more engagement instead of just posting something and, you know, no one's buys it or nothing. You know what I mean? Like a lot of relationships got built during that time. And I, I can't say that me getting the top 100 uh, house artists on track source per se did much for me, but the hard work I put in to achieve that, like came with a lot of cool benefits. A lot of people I still chat to today that I met through that year of just putting fair music out. Nice. Nice. Um, also, I'd like yeah, to man. ask, I'd like to ask you in, uh, in Toronto, what's the music scene like right now, bro? Like in LA, I'm, I'm wondering if it's the same, but in LA right now, bro, techno is like everything right now. Everybody loves techno. What's it like over there in Toronto right now? Everyone's always loved techno, man. That's just, just what it is. It's really, um, what's the word for it it just works well for the club man like it's it's easy to dance to it's very club friendly music a lot of other music is you know not as club friendly i guess you could say like i don't i feel like you could go to a, a techno show and not know anything about dance music and you could bob your head and fit in it's easy to fit in feel comfortable you know what i mean no one wants to be that one person like in the middle of a dance floor and like or sorry it's empty and you go in there and everyone's looking at you you know or you know, you know, what I'm trying to say it's just very club friendly music. Um, but to answer your question, what's the music scene like here? A lot of tech house. It's always been tech house. Yeah. Um, lately, there's been, you know, I'm going to say this. I'm not sure if it's because I've had my ear, you know, closer to the ground or things are changing. But I'm going to say I think things are changing right now. There's nice. been a lot of cool parties pop up seeing a lot of garage now, a lot of nice, a lot of breaks and drum and bass has always been here. Nice. Um, but there's just more more places to go and, and listen to it, I think. You know, and uh, over the last two years, we've actually had artists that played Garage and Breaks, like, come over here. Nice. Um, like, Last Planet, they brought a few a few artists over. Like, they brought Conducta. They brought Interplanetary Criminal. They brought Bakey. They brought, um, you know, those are some of the guys I'm really into. But they've brought yeah. lots of different guys. And they've kind of it kind of really helped push the push the scene here. So I'm going to give a lot of a lot of credit to them. Nice. Um, and there's also some other stuff too, right? Like, I don't know, like Toronto, Toronto's a busy place, man. Like there's always something for everyone. You just got to find it. It might not be as in your face as, yeah. you know, going to like a club night at Coda. But even Coda's yeah. bringing a lot of new people over. Like I've seen they're bringing Sammy Vergy over. Like that's that's kind of new for Coda. They brought Eliza Rose the other weekend. Oh, nice. Uh, salute. You know what I mean? So like that, I feel like those types of acts are kind of new for Coda. So it's it's cool to see that a club like that is bringing artists that are making that type of music. You know, yeah. like I feel like that is that's that's growth, you know? Yeah. Yeah. See, I feel like that's where the L.A. scene is kind of lacking, to be honest, bro. Like the, there is, you know, there's Tech House. And like I said, but there's a huge boom in techno right now, especially like these warehouse underground raves. Like it's yep. like, especially like this dark industrial techno and, uh, you know, the sound that you guys have over there. That's what I'm trying to bring over here, man. Like I, LA is lacking in that area, bro. I don't, and I don't know why, you know, um, also I'm wondering, yeah. you know, how, how is there like a, there's a direct connection with Toronto and like London, huh? You guys are like connected. Um, I mean, we both have the queen on our money. <laughs> I'm wondering, you know, like, how, like, how not... far how far is that flight? Like, is it a sh quick flight? No. No? No, I think it's faster no. for me to fly to L.A. than it is for me to fly over there. Yeah. Um, I just think that the history of Canada is, like, British, yeah. you know, British people coming over here and, uh -huh. you know, setting the flag down. And I don't know, that, that's a... <laughs> That's hard. it's like i don't know man. i want to get into that too crazy yeah, like, yeah. you know what i mean like i'm not even <laughs> fully positive on it but i know there's you know a lot a lot going on there but you know basically british people come over here or scottish i guess just like uk in general like they come over here early on and uh you know we you know we pay respect to the queen and stuff here mm -hmm. we have their you know we have her printed on our money and shit like there's definitely like a relationship there um but no, it's not like around the corner by any means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just I've always felt like that there is that like connection, that relationship between the UK and Toronto. Um, what about are you a, a Drake? A lot of exchange students. Yeah, are you a are you a Drake fan? 
No. <laughs> <laughs> you can be honest. You can be yo, honest. Yeah, I don't I don't I don't not like him or anything like that. Um like yo, like he's cool. Like I guess <laughs> I'm a fan of him in a way. Like he's from here, like he's doing it, like he represents yeah, yeah. any chance that he can get. Like I'm not not a fan of him, you know, yeah, maybe yeah. like his music. I don't really listen to it, but I just don't really listen to uh like hip hop from today's age in general. Yeah, me too. Like, that's just kind of that's just kind of what it is for me. So like to say I'm a fan or not a fan, like I don't really think it's fair. Like I respect him. I respect him. Yeah. Cool, cool. So what advice would you give to up and coming artists looking to break into the electronic music industry? Network, man. Network. Network's everything. Yeah. No one's gonna book you if the like, your name is not sitting in the top of their fucking brain. You know, like that's that's just the facts. You know what I mean? Like you got to network, 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 network. And like that goes with everything in life, too. Like that's more than yeah. just music industry. But yeah, man. like, you know, there's people that don't make music at all. Like, you know, there's plenty of just people who just DJ, you know what I yeah. mean? And like they get a lot of bookings as well as we're like, you you got like an introvert guy who just wants to sit in the studio all day and he makes really kick ass music. But, you know, ain't no one hearing it. Yeah. You know, so, you know, it just goes to show you like, you know, skill still Damn, matters man. but it, it it isn't it isn't everything at all it's it's really about who you know networking and uh like i said before i'll say it again creating your own luck that's uh that's like yeah. the biggest thing man yeah i love it that, that's very uh wise advice um so can you tell us more about your passion project i see you're wearing the shirt you know 95 dance oh yeah and and it's goal that, man. and it's goal and purpose yeah man so I said earlier that I touch on, you know, how local comes around full circle. Um, so this really touches on where I said that, you know, if I lived maybe closer to some of these record labels, I could benefit from it a bit more. And, you know, with like some thought involved, I thought, let's let's create that over here. Like, let's let's make that hot spot. Like, I'm going to reach out to artists here who I know have some solid skill behind them, have solid productions. And we're just going to kind of make this like a home base little thing. So I reached out to basically everyone that I could think of who I wanted on here. And I've, you know, met some new people too, who I didn't even know about. And really the main purpose was to keep it local, keep it Canadian and leverage all the networking that I've done as Dusko and, you know, try to leverage that as much as I can to get the music out. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of guys like, there's so many artists out here and like, I just feel like no one's like clicked up. Like we're all here, like kind of just sending our music over there, like on our own, um, on our own path, but oh wow, we're never really working together. You know, yeah. I'm like, there's so much, there's so much talent here not to be working together, you know? So I just stepped up and I thought, well, let me just do it then. Cause I, I care. I feel like if anyone's going to do it, it should probably just be me. Cause like, I don't know. I have control over my own destiny, I guess. You know what I mean? And yeah. I feel like, I give a fuck like I really do. So um, I set up the label. I reached out and it really just started from there. We've only had one release from someone who wasn't in Canada and his name's Ben and he's out in the UK. Um, but like I built a relationship with him like for a long time and he's like he makes really fucking good music. So yeah. I was like just really happy to get him on there. Like it's not exclusively to people in Canada, but the main focus really is people in canada yeah 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 so you're that's cool man so you're building a little uh community over there um exactly also i'd like to ask you you know i've always been confused you know because it's like to the w when you were making music under the duscope name right that yeah that kind of music is labeled garage you know and then now this new genre that you're making is garage i guess is the difference it's UK, uk garage versus garage well if you're going by like track source genres, then I guess like all my music went into garage like place. But I I wouldn't really say that what I was making was garage like that much. Like I'd say it was like way more housey than anything. Like mm -hmm. I always borrowed from the garage genre. Like there's always aspects. Like I like the skippy drums aspect and I like the chord stabs. I love mm -hmm. me some chord stabs. Okay. And um you know, I was just kind of implemented it into, into my music, but I wouldn't really say it was like that garagey. Like I'd, I'd say it's house music, like really okay. at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, as for the stuff I'm making now, like, you know, it's, it's not house music. <laughs> no. It's uh, it, it, it's garage for sure. Like, you know, it's, yeah. it's two step. It's super swung out, man. Speed garage. Like, you know, that's that's what it is. Or like jungle. I'm dabbing a lot in breaks and jungle, too. 
Yeah. Yeah, I no, feel like man. I feel like that new sound you're making definitely it kind of has some elements of drum and bass to it. I fuck with it. I, I like it, man. So, so yeah. <laughs> oh, especially the the forthcoming stuff. We've been like really trying to to take from drum and bass a lot of the jump up stuff. But I won't I won't touch too much on that. Uh, like we're, we're innovating right now, though. I, I believe in it. I yeah. believe in it. Okay. So I'd like to ask you, you know, so how do you balance your time between your music career and you know your job and other commitments in life? Damn, man. Um, well, you just got to make time, man. Like, you know, if you really love it, you'll make time. You know, I spend a lot of time with my girlfriend, um, you know, but sometimes I just got to like, just take a break. You know what I mean? Come home, make some beats, <laughs> like come back and we'll hang out with her after. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. And like create creativity doesn't always, like you can't choose when you're going to be creative. So, you know, essentially like if I'm feeling like, like I really need to make some music right now, then like, I'm going to go give it a chance. Like, and most of the time I make music here and I have a Mac mini um, that I use to make music, but I also have a laptop too. And like, I usually bring that around. So like, if I'm kind of vibing, like I have like a, a little sample selection on the, on the, the laptop and uh, like, I'll try to create the idea and then we can always just bring it to the computer after. So I guess I just like set myself up in a way where, you know, if I am feeling like making music, than I can. My last job that I was working also gave me a lot of time to make music, like actually at the job. Um, so I was uh, I was just a custodian, basically for a little bit at one of the school boards around here. And you know, once like my area was clean, like I just like I had to be in the school still. So I would just like prop my legs up in the library and make beats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah, man. It was hard to. Uh, yeah, man, it was hard to find a job. Like I went to school and I actually just recently got hired at a job where, you know, I went to school for it and I'm like really excited about it. I start next week, but, you know, leading up to that moment, like I worked a lot of different jobs and that school board one stuck around a bit. That was a really cool perk about it. Nice. Yeah. I like what you've been saying throughout this episode, creating your own luck, you know, so I can imagine how many, <laughs> how many people yeah. out there, how many people out there have a job like that? And in their downtime, what are they doing? They're scrolling on social media, wasting time, bro. That you that's that's the key to life, bro. You know, maximizing time, you know. So I like I like hearing that. Um I try, man. I definitely, you know, I'm a victim of being a, a wasteoid as well, man. Just sitting there scrolling, man. It's hard <laughs> not to, man. Like yeah. that's they built it like that. You can't even oh, blame yeah. the people, man. You can't even blame the people. Like, that's just what it is now. It's crazy. Yeah. Damn, yeah, that is crazy. Okay, so. What about, okay, so you have a background in graphic design, right? Isn't that what you went to school for? Yeah, I went for interactive media. So I learned nice. graphic design, uh, like a little bit of video editing and special effects stuff. Uh, yeah. We touched on coding as well, like web development. Nice, bro. It was more of a generalized course. But yeah, I did learn a whole bunch of different things. Yeah, I work in marketing myself. Uh, I wanted to ask you, you yeah. know, so those those videos that you did you make those videos that that you recently put out on on your facebook page the 95 dance with the record and it was like the alien and the spaceship and all that did you make that <laughs> i didn't make that video um but i did edit things in the video so basically when i was younger i used to watch a lot of cartoons and anime and on i think cartoon network there was like an anime hour for like a few hours it was called toonami and essentially that was like the introduction to the anime hour for like an hour or sorry for like a couple hours or whatever and uh and that was in 2001 so basically all the music we're doing right now is like kind of based around like you know the 90s and like early double o's and one of my earliest memories of that era was watching anime on cartoon network and that, seeing that introduction every time so I thought, you know, how would I incorporate that into the way we market this this release? So essentially, I just downloaded like the highest res version of that video and I propped it into DaVinci Resolve Fusion and I was tracking the screens on the video and then replacing it with um, with different images. I had a few different ones. Like I replaced it with videos like it was going by. We were like DJing and stuff, but um after a couple of revisions i thought it was best for that to just be like the title to like introduce everybody on the va and have it come together um so i worked on that video but all like the crazy animation aspects i did not create it i uh, also 
had um, a video made for us by a girl named Alice in Montreal, and she's a 3D artist, and uh, she uses Blender. She's super dope. I met her through one of my buddies. It's a sister, and uh, like she gave me a decent rate, and uh, we did that basement video the uh, for the party next week. That one looked pretty cool. We like yeah, got her to mimic the, like the whole venue, so like the guys like actually dancing like in the venue. You know what I mean? So oh, shit. it's like it's, it's it's super cool, man. Like I don't know, I just kind of want it like that. You see that video, like you know exactly what it is. Like yeah. yo, that's the mascot and yeah. that's the venue and it's fucking going down and i was like yo like this is sick as fuck oh yeah bro. that was the vision she nailed it so if anyone's watching this you need some 3d work like go hit up alice because she's dope as fuck yeah bro you're definitely on to something I, I saw that and i was like oh shit like dude this is badass this is dope it's unique it's a uh, very high quality you know like and like i said the mascot is that record cartoon character bro yeah yeah exactly you're, fucking, you're on to something with this bro I, I i love to see it um yeah respects man yeah so kind of closing it out, you know, how has the music industry, especially for independent artists, changed since you started your journey? Um, when I first started, everyone was blowing up on SoundCloud. People were making like free downloads or just not even free downloads like originals, but like SoundCloud was the place that you blew up that and YouTube channels. And there was no you know TikTok or nothing like that i think that was like some of the earliest earliest social media like facebook and maybe instagram at that time and you know companies like that at the start they're trying to get people on the platform it's way easier to blow up during that time i think and uh, there was also more tools to blow up too like you know i remember at one point if you had a free download you could fan gate it and basically they had to abide by all of your all your gates in order to get that track as where now there's like laws in play where you can't force someone to follow or you know whatever the case may be so it's a little bit harder you know that was that was then i also feel like a number one on beatport when i first started meant a lot more than it does now i don't know if you know being on like the biggest label and be having a number one on beatport will I don't know, blow you up the same as it used to. Um, now, like a lot of people aren't even putting music on labels. Like I feel like they blew up from the label. A lot of people are moving independent. You see yeah. a lot of like you click your favorite artist and you go and you look to see what label it was released on. And the label is literally called, you know, their name. Like they did it independently. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so that, that seems to be the move these days. It's a lot more independent. Spotify has made a huge imprints on how promoters view artists if you have no listeners you know yeah. <laughs> and it comes with all this data too right like before like you didn't know like where where your listeners were coming from as we're now now you do like you can clearly fucking see it you're like oh like you have you know a couple thousand people in toronto canada that are viewing your fucking music all the time well you give that to your agent sends it over to the to the uh to the club or whoever the promoter is trying to book and no, you can like, you can leverage that. Like, there's so much data involved now. Things are just more technical, man. Like, as as technology is kind of growing, like yeah. so has how I guess the industry is like under the hood. Yeah. You know, before my time, you you basically just I don't know. You met people at the record store and shit. You know what I mean? Like, you yeah. came out. Like, everything was in person. And like, I, I like to touch on that too. Like, an in an in person connection still outshines everything. Yeah. So like you cannot just sit behind your computer and hope that things are going to work out. Like you do have to leave and meet people. It's yeah. True. Yeah. You're right, yeah. man. I think that's what I need to be uh, better at is getting back out there, you know? Um, and uh, what are your thoughts on And with dude, with AI too, like AI is growing rapidly, bro. And it's like, it's able to make music now. And there's, you know, there's fake DJs, bro. And fake producers. And you know, yeah. how, how is that going to change the game, bro? Like when people are just using AI and, and, and they're just good at marketing and, and doing Instagram reels and TikToks and, you know, it's going to get crazy, bro. I, I don't know, man. Like, as far as creating, like, I just don't know how you would get it consistent. And what I mean is, like, if I asked AI to make me a record and it did, like, how do I continually get AI to make records that sound exactly like 
the one that I got it to make for me the first time. Like, I feel like we all kind of have our sound at the end of the day. Yeah. Like, you can kind of tell that there's like, you know, a sample we like to use or we tag it or something. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't know how AI is going to sort that out, you know, yeah. all the way through. Like, it would, it would literally have to like learn. Like, it, maybe if there was like an AI plugin that like watched you produce and made like suggestions and then gathered up all this data or yeah. something and then like basically helped you write the track almost like a ghost producer, then I feel like that would be pretty cool i guess um i mean there is some i don't know man like there's some parts of ai i really like like right now there's a lot of like ai mastering and stuff like that's pretty solid if you just if you want to send a demo out you know what i mean Mm -hmm. like you know have it like loud and ready for whoever is going to listen to your track like that's kind of convenient you know where the the stem separation uh that's been great uh fl studio i use fl for anyone who didn't know um and they just implemented that into the DAW now. So like I can just find any sample and just right click it and split it into stems. And like, you know, those AI tools are fucking amazing. Yeah, like right now it's in the early phases of AI. So right now the the yeah. music the music that it's putting out and and like you said, you know, how is it gonna know to to keep your your music on brand, like with the same elements, the same sounds? It right now it's in the yeah. early it's in the early stages, so it's it's difficult. It it, it won't you know, meet those, those standards. But as AI continues to, de- to de- develop over these years, it's going to get better and better. And, you know, I'm using AI at my job, you know, for my, for my writing and the marketing job. And, you know, I'm able to so, set yeah. the, set the messaging, like use these words for this client and, and it's learning, bro. So it's like, it's going to be crazy to, to see how AI develops over these next years. Um, it's great for that aspect. Like I find like I'm terrible at English and writing and stuff like press things of that nature so like ai has been beautiful for that yeah. aspect yeah. yeah okay so kind of closing out closing it out so what are your plans and aspirations for the future of your career um basically just grow the 95 label right now to be honest i'm having like so much fun with it like it's been more fun than me trying to collect the pokey badges i find um and i think a lot of that is because like everyone's so local like it's not just behind the computer anymore. Like I'm actually able to like go to these people's places or like we're meeting for activities that aren't music related. And like, we're just building friendships. And I feel like it's just made everything feel more fun and less alone. Like it it does feel like a, like a team environment more or less than, you know, just like a solo artist. So it's, uh, it's kind of made things feel really fresh and it seems like everyone's kind of digging it or, you know, it's, it's picking up nicely and uh, that makes me happy so honestly i'm just gonna say i'm just gonna say that that and uh <laughs> uh shooting par on the golf course <laughs> <laughs> that, that's it man nice nice bro um so yeah can, can you send the listeners out there a final message of uh, motivation and inspiration yeah just put in the hours whether you're DJing or you're producing, just put in the hours. There's a saying, you got to put in 10,000 hours. It can't yep. be any more true. And yep. I've seen it with multiple people. Just put in the time and it works out. And, you know, create your own luck. Go out there, meet people, network. And, uh, you know, just have that good energy, man. Like m- manifest, manifest. Like things will things will work out when you put the you put the right energy out there. Pay it forward. You know what I mean? Just be positive, help people out. I try to help anyone when I can. It's like, you know, it's not like a selfish thing. It's really just like about uh, just pushing things forward and helping, helping people innovate. You know, it's what it is. Oh yeah, man. Those are wise words. And yeah, I'm still trying to find a way to get you out here in LA, man. So, so hopefully, (laughs) hopefully hopefully in the future, bro. But yeah. So I want to thank you, Parker. I want to thank you you for uh, meeting with me today. Thank you for providing such a fun and entertaining and insightful episode. You know, so lastly, please tell everyone where to find your information and I'll also add it to the description of the video. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me, Daniel. It's, uh, it's been real for sure. Um, yeah, you can find me at Operator P on Instagram. I don't have a Facebook page, but Spotify, you know, Instagram, YouTube, <laughs> just Operator P, man. I actually sort that out maybe a little bit more, but um, yeah, find me on Daniel's podcast, I guess now too. Um, yeah. Thanks for listening to me. Awesome. It's been solid, man. Awesome. Thank you, bro. Have a good one. Okay, man. Peace.